Hi there, my name is Ryan Dreifurst and I'm a graduate research assistant supervised by Professor Robert Heath at the University of Texas at Austin. Now my research lies at the intersection of machine learning and wireless communications. Today, I'll be presenting our work in collaboration with Dr. Mandar Kulkarni and Charlie Zhang from Samsung. For our submission, we investigated the efficacy and training considerations for deep learning based carrier frequency offset estimation with 1 bit ADCs. So, now with that, let's get started. Today, I'll start with a high level overview of the task of 1 bit carrier frequency offset estimation and briefly describe some previously proposed methods. Then, I'll highlight the characteristics we are concerned with when considering future wireless communications. Afterwards, we'll move into our contributions, which begin by taking a look at the data and data set variations, as well as the networks we found to perform well. Finally, we'll look at complexity considerations for neural networks, specifically looking at real-time and near-real-time processing. So now let's take a look at the one-bit carrier frequency offset estimation problem. To motivate this, let's consider a millimeter wave MIMO communication system. Now in this framework, there's a wide spectrum of unused bandwidth, allowing for very high data rates. But due to the high loss at millimeter wave carrier frequencies, both the transmitter and receiver have antenna arrays, which help overcome low signal noise ratio. Unfortunately, each RF chain requires its own data converter, which must operate extremely fast to use this large bandwidth, leading to power hungry and costly systems. A simple way to reduce the power consumption is to use low resolution data converters with the simplest form being one bit resolution. So when we look at this paradigm, the baseband processing is more complex and it's unable to reach the same performance as full resolution. Now prior work has looked at a number of different methods with the most common ones being listed here are correlation based, time varying thresholding, message passing algorithms and dithering. But we need to consider our framework we've looked at so prior to channel estimation, MIMO communications tend to be operating at very low signal noise ratio, which makes correlation based estimators perform poorly. Now the estimator that we use should also be computationally efficient. So we can ensure that it operates in real time or at least near real time and doesn't require intensive hardware. This removes many time bearing threshold algorithms, which require coarse and fine grid searching and lead to very long delay times that limit the possibilities. In many applications, the coherence time may also be fairly short on the order of milliseconds, tens of milliseconds, maybe up to hundreds of milliseconds. So ideally, the algorithm should require very little overhead. So it should use short pilot sequences, which prevents us from using many message passing algorithms. Finally, dithering is considered in a number of ways, but has been found to be less effective than the FFT for one bit resolution, especially in frequency estimation. So now here's a list of some prior work in this area and there are more references at the end, but those are the ones we specifically referenced here. Thus, this brings us to our problem statement specifically. Now to be explicit, we would like an estimator which uses one bit data with low signal noise ratio to estimate the frequency given only a small number of samples. So we propose a data driven solution where the estimator can learn the frequency estimation function. Thus, we're trying to learn directly from the raw IQ samples rather than an engineered feature space. We also define both the in-phase and quadrature components as separate real features to make it a little bit more amenable to deep learning methods. We focus on single sinusoid estimation in this work with expansion into multiple sinusoid estimation in future work. So now let's check out our contributions. We naturally divide this problem into its two components, the data and the algorithms. So for data, we first generate the data based on our choice of block length, training signal noise ratio, and quantization. To generate the data, we use uniformly distributed phase and frequency to create sinusoids. Then we add Gaussian noise and apply the quantization function. We found in our initial investigation that using SNR below our low range, which is 0 to 10 dB here, the received data was actually just too noisy to learn the function. But on the other hand, 
using high signal noise ratio resulted in no noise and actually the model couldn't generalize well. So we've limited our training areas to 0 to 10 dB and 10 to 20 dB. Intuitively, you might assume that training with data exactly the same as the test case would have the best performance. However, we actually show in our paper that this is not the case, especially in terms of signal noise ratio selection, which has counterintuitive results where the high SNR training actually leads to worse performance at high SNR. Once we've simulated this data, we then split it into our training and, and validation sets for learning through gradient descent. Now, once we have this data, we need to consider what network architectures we are best suited to the problem. We first looked at just your three classical architectures, specifically the artificial neural network or fully connected, the convolutional neural network, and the recurrent neural network. These three form much of the basis for deep learning today. We also use a variation on convolutional neural networks called residual neural networks, which are a common way to prevent vanishing or exploding gradients and are quite useful, especially with long data sequences like we have. Now, all told, each network has its own intrinsic value. The simplicity of the artificial neural network is great, while the similarity between convolutional neural networks and classical signal processing techniques gives us a lot of hope for that. And the memory in the recurrent neural network obviously has a chance to perform quite well. So we explored and tested these network styles under the condition that the size of the model has to be less than 10 megabytes and no more than 10 layers could be used. This way we can enforce strict limits on the architecture search while also being useful to near real-time operation. We selected the best performing network for each of these types and used the simulated data we just showed to compare with traditional methods like the periodogram, Welsh's method, and music. So now, the most important question is, how effective are neural network estimators for signal processing? This includes both estimation performance as well as execution time, which is something that neural networks are really not known for. So looking at estimation performance, we have two plots here. On the left, we have the results for training with low signal noise ratio and quantized data with a block length of 16. There are a few noteworthy points here. Specifically, we can see that our estimators have more than 17 dB improvement near like minus five dB SNR over the traditional methods, but still approach a pretty similar asymptotic error. Also, traditional estimators actually start degrading in performance above about 10 dB or so, while our networks do not show that. Uh, this is actually a common problem and was one case for the use of dithering early on. We can also see that even though our network has learned most of the implicit bias at low SNR, it still does not reach the Kramer morale bound, and in fact is more than 20 dB away once we hit 0 dB SNR. This shows that our estimator is still not nearly reaching the limits of performance. Now on the right side, we can see what happens as the pilot length increases. As should probably be expected, the estimators improve with increasing block length, similar to your traditional estimators. We also see that the artificial neural network does not maintain performance relative to the others as the length increases. This suggests that our nearly linear model will struggle to fit the highly nonlinear problem, obviously making it less suited to this. So we can see that these neural networks are fairly good estimators but that probably could have been expected. But we also require that they be fast and efficient enough for near real-time operation. So that brings us to our second area, which is the execution time. So in this case, we've averaged over 500 runs on various lengths of data using FFT, Welsh's method, and then our estimators. In each case, the execution is run on a P100 Tesla GPU, and we use whatever optimizations are available. Unfortunately, Welsh's method and the recurrent neural network do not have the same highly optimized versions available in CUDA and TensorFlow, so these don't really compare well. Most importantly, we can see that our networks are faster than the FFT under every case and scale much more efficiently as well, with the scaling being less than order of square root n. Also, even though the recurrent neural network does not have an optimized version, it still doesn't scale very well versus the block length 
which is one reason it's almost never used for real time large input data. So we can see that those limits that we imposed on the architecture, that specifically being less than 10 megabytes and having a very sh short number of layers, those led to very efficient terms of time estimators. So this is very promising results. And we're actually really excited about this, especially as we continue on towards future work with multiple sinusoids and detection and estimation going on. But now to conclude, I really wanna stress the most important takeaways from this. First, synchronization is a very tough setup under the regime we've given, where the signal to noise ratio is low, the block lengths are short, and the data is heavily quantized. Second, We've shown that our networks perform as well or better than traditional techniques, especially using well-constructed training data. And then finally, we've shown that deep learning can be designed and optimized to be very efficient with faster execution time than even our, our periodogram estimators. So with that, I would like to thank Samsung Research America for their support, as well as the conference organizers for their work setting up this conference, given this difficult time we're in. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.